Whether it's mobility, connectivity, or autonomy leading the way, the city as we know it today is changing right before our eyes. But what will it look like and who will live there? Tomorrow is the topic on this edition of AutoLine This Week. Underwriting for AutoLine This Week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine This Week. You know, it was probably around 120 years ago that the first horseless carriages began to appear. And in less than a decade, they transformed the American landscape with roads and parking lots and semaphores and garages. And we're about to see the landscape change yet again with autonomous cars, mobility, electrification. And I've got three people to talk all about this change that's coming because today we're talking about the city of tomorrow. Joining us for this discussion are Robert Hampshire. He's a research professor in human factors at the University of Michigan's Transportation Research Institute. Jessica Robinson is the director of City Solutions at the Ford Motor Company. And Kevin Layden is the director of Electrified Powertrain Engineering, also at Ford. And I want to thank all three of you for coming on here today. Thanks for having me. Jessica, I want to start with you. Mm -hmm. You're the director of City Solutions at the Ford Motor Company. What the heck does that mean? That's right. What are we up to? So City Solutions is part of a group within Ford focused on mobility, specifically smart mobility. And we set up a business last year to look at the new ways people will get around using shared services and incorporating other technologies like the ones you mentioned. But City Solutions specifically, we're looking at in, this, um, in the city of tomorrow, what will technology empower as people try to get around? And we work directly with governments and others locally on the ground around the world to understand what mobility challenges they have and how Ford might actually solve them. And Robert, you look into the human factors part of all this. What's that entail? Yeah, absolutely. At Michigan, at uh, Transportation Research Institute, where I am, we have a large group that's looking at the human factors, the experience of people interacting with new technologies. So how do people interact with cr adaptive cruise control? How do inter individuals interact with autonomous vehicles? How do they experience shared modes of transportation, like car sharing and ride sharing? So. We have large uh, research programs in all those areas and many more. So. And Kevin, you're you're into electrification. Electrified What's the power trains. That? You know, anything that makes the vehicle go forward uh, can make it a little bit better with electrification. Whether it's hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery electric vehicles. You know, Ford's been at it for over 10 years now, and mainly on just a, the retail side of actually making a vehicle. As we get into the the ride sharing, the uh, the autonomy, and so forth, you start thinking about the sensors. You think start thinking about the computing power and what's gonna power that. And it really makes sense as, as we put more miles on the road, we put more uh, miles on each vehicle, that efficiency becomes really even more important than it was even to, uh, with a base vehicle. So we see electrification as being a real important part to the future and, uh, and it's gonna deliver better economy for all of us. As I had mentioned, cities really changed a little over a century ago when the automobile really started to catch on. What changes should we be on the lookout for in the next decade or two? Yeah, so I mean, sticking with electrification, one of the things that we see with cities is they want to better understand how vehicles might supplement the other transportation systems that they already have. So they're thinking about more efficient use of the roadways, but when you have that, what else might you do with sidewalks? Could you put new trees and plantings in and actually make walking more enjoyable? Or could you take your bus system or your rail system and actually connect it to potentially a shared or on-demand vehicle that might finish that last mile for you? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of this nexus that we've talked about, this shared electric autonomous. And so these sort of technologies and services kind of all sort of mesh and mold together and work together. I mean, when you have shared vehicles, part of the, the point there is to, you know, maximize the utilization of individual vehicles so that you can get rid of your own personal vehicle. And so to do that efficiently, the powertrain or maybe be, you know, electric. That, that, those kind of systems are more, much more efficient with those kind of use cases. So there's a really nice nexus between shared and electric. And I'm sure we'll talk about autonomous too. Probably. Of course, yeah. And I think that mesh is, the, yeah. is a good point. Yeah. And I think uh, you can't talk about autonomy without talking about electrification. Yeah. You can't talk about the connected vehicle. And you can't tackle, talk about the city of tomorrow without using these new technologies and this high tech. Yeah. So it's really driving how a little different uh, 
I guess, posture of the auto industry, uh, who we recruit and who we're, bring, who we're bringing in. Uh, so it, it's presenting new challenges, but the opportunities are just incredible. Kevin, what do you mean that you can't talk about autonomy without talking about electrification? Well, autonomy, if you look at it, uh, that computing power that's required, the number of sensors, the radar, the LIDAR, uh, there's different sets and different people have proposed different solutions, but all of them really consume a significant amount of electricity. And to power those and to power them efficiently, an electric ve electrified vehicle, probably at least a uh, hybrid vehicle, really makes sense. And doing it with... Uh, a band-aid, doing it with something with big alternators. It's just not going to be a really world-class solution. And with people really looking for that, that, uh, that efficiency, uh, you know, for a real city of tomorrow, I, I see the, the, the hybrid as, as a minimum entry of it. What do you guys think the city of the future will start to look like in the sense that, I mean, I've heard that one-third of all the cars driving around Manhattan are just looking for a place to park, right. you know, Presumably, mobility could solve that parking issue. And if all of a sudden we're getting rid of parked cars or cars driving around looking for a parking spot, one would think that would open up the streets to flow a whole lot better. So elaborate a bit on that. Where do you see this all going? Yeah, I, mean, I could say that you know, my research group and the colleagues that I've been working with have actually looked at this parking question uh, quite a bit. So we've built uh, uh, intelligent parking systems in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, been involved in large programs in San Francisco as well. And so, yeah, so the, a large fraction of people on the road are driving, uh, looking for parking in circles. Not quite, we found, our, my group <laughs> found that it's not quite 30%. That's a folklore that's out there, but it's a substantial amount of uh, 25%? pollution. 25%? No, no, no. Uh, 10, 15% is okay. what we're looking okay. at. Our, our research says, but still some substantial amount of pollution and congestions generated by people just driving around looking in circles. Yeah. So this, in the future, the city of the future of tomorrow, certainly that wouldn't be part of it, I would hope. Yeah, and that's certainly something we hear too. What's interesting about being part of a, a company that's looking at the technologies of the future is knowing what's coming, but also knowing that we as a business unit want to focus on changes that we can make today. And so there are things like shared rides, which may still you know, occupy a space in a lane, but at least there's more people in them. So Chariot, for instance, which is our uh, ride-sharing commute shuttle in San Francisco, studies show that those might actually take about 25 cars off the road. So that's each, a, each, each shuttle, shuttle. could that's take right. 25 cars yeah. off the road. And there's not 25 seats in that van either. So there's some additional efficiency that's happening because you're connecting to other modes along the way. Um, so if you start with that and you build a business today using the technology that we have, that's what's so exciting about doing this within Ford Motor Company is we also make the vehicles, right? And so as we get into businesses of the future, we can actually um, take advantages of the best of both. And if you start thinking about when you start reducing that congestion, how much more efficient the vehicles are as they move with purpose to where they're going mm -hmm. rather than stuck in a grid right. and not moving. Uh, and you start thinking about when it does become more efficient, we'll probably use the vehicles more than we do today because it makes more sense, it's more convenient, and it really a, a becomes a virtuous circle. It allows us to put more technology into the vehicles that do better things for us. And uh, you know, in my case, better powertrains, electrified powertrains that make it more efficient and cleaner. The point that you're making is an interesting one because if traffic flows at a steady speed, the car, even if it's a piston engine running on gasoline, is operating at its most efficient point. So if you can improve traffic flow, we can get a reduction Absolutely. in emissions, even if it's the same vehicles. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's one of the keys, and I think a lot of people don't quite understand how smoothing traffic really reduces the, the NOx forming emissions, things that cause that brown haze over the cities. And uh, couple that with electrification, which are among our cleanest vehicles, and it really, really improves things. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we, to, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, we know other things about congestion, too, which is air quality, but also economic costs. I mean, the time that we spend sitting in a vehicle or trucks delivering goods or hospital emergency responders stuck in traffic, there's an actual cost to communities as well by an inefficient movement of vehicles in the system. And that's something that we hear loud and clear when we get out and talk to mayors on the ground is, help me solve that. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to just piggyback on the point where 
you know, with connected vehicle technologies, colleagues of mine at Michigan, you know, connecting the traffic lights with vehicles. So as you approach a, tra a traffic light, maybe you sort of smoothly enter uh, into a green. You don't have to stop. So kind of smooth out the stop and go patterns and increase throughput through corridors and through the city. So there's this really nice connection between technology, be it connected vehicles or vehicle to infrastructure communication, and also the congestion and throughput uh, and smoothing out traffic. So there's a really nice nexus between those points. I've seen some people speculate that in the future, when we get to full autonomy, deep in the century where everything's fully autonomous, that maybe we don't even need traffic lights. Maybe we don't need stop signs or yield signs. Everything's just going to go through because all the cars are communicating with each other. Is that crazy, or do you think that could happen? Well, it's happening now. <laughs> it's happening now at Michigan in the research lab. So we have, have colleagues uh, who are actively working on this, not just at Michigan, but other universities and research labs, I'm sure, to think about what, is inter what do intersections look like without traffic lights. And there's ways to orchestrate those so they're much, much more efficient and increase the throughput dramatically. Um, so those, those concepts are out there. Uh, I don't know, you know when the public will see them, but we're working through those things. You're now. working on it now. now. Yeah. So you know, when you describe it and you think about it, it seems very futuristic. Yeah. But if I look at my career, and I've been with Ford for 30 years now, and I think where I started, in talking to people about having uh, uh, a program, uh, a powertrain control module that you could flash or a reprogram on the fly, uh, having uh, the control to control spark with a computer and control fuel injection, it was a panacea. This isn't going to happen. The cost is going to be prohibitive. And uh, we overtook that real quickly you know, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and in, in years. And if you look at how we stepped through it and where we've gone with emissions, the technology that the auto industry has brought to bear on, on these problems have, have just been all, just awe-inspiring. And so for me as an engineer looking at it, yeah, it looks pretty tough, this, this whole autonomy thing. But I start looking at what's happened to date, uh, and I look at the semi-autonomous features we have. Uh, the, I've got a Ford Fusion that will park, a parallel park. It'll do a perpendicular park, and it does it flawlessly with the fewest number of moves. And uh, to see technology take it a step further, I, uh, I might not understand it completely now, but I know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I am certain that uh, the engineers we've got on staff and what we're doing, and the, the commitment we've got is we're going to make a, a vehicle without a steering wheel, you know, mm -hmm. early. Uh, 2021. Year, 2021. This is what Ford says. And it's going to happen. I, I have great faith that we're going to do that, and, and I am really, really impressed with every step we've made on it. I, I got to say that it's, it's great stuff, and uh, it, it is awe-inspiring. Yeah, and th that same question, I mean, we get that when we're out again, talking to mayors, chiefs of staff at the city level, departments of transportation, they all say, I mean, come on, is this really happening? We say, yes, it is. Come to mm -hmm. Michigan and see the vehicles on a test track. Um, but they're also thinking about this road design question because I think it's important as we look at any technology curve and the adoption rate, we know that there's places where it will take hold first. But to have fully autonomous vehicles everywhere in the world, that is a long time coming, right? And so you get into urban environments and what are the improvements to quality of life that an autonomous system can actually bring to bear, particularly if it's electrified. Um, there may be opportunities for tr 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 very different road design than we have today in cities. But I also think you have to think about the inter interaction at an intersection or otherwise with people, uh, where you have pedestrians crossing or you, know, you still have a dog that runs across the road. That was my pet, right? I want to make sure that um, what happens in that case, but also, you know, the system in our cities has gotten so much more complex already where you have multiple services operating. You have a goods delivery truck pulled over on the side of the road and now uh, the poor package delivery guy is trying to get stuff up because I ordered it online, right? So even if the vehicle may enable a roadway change, there's lots of other stuff that's taken place that also influences this. And so I agree, it's just a fascinating time to be working on these problems. But and as soon as the technology demonstrates that it, can, that it has an advantage, that can provide a, a solution to a problem that the cities have or a, a problem that the police departments have or, or the delivery uh, service has, they will adopt it, and they will adopt it so quickly. So you talk about 2050. 
I don't think we even imagined what's going to happen in 2050 yet. I think what we're thinking about now is in the 2025 time frame, and I think that's, that's going to happen. And I think what, what happens between 2025 and 2050, that's just downright exciting. Well, the technology is racing ahead. I t completely agree. But Robert, we've got to talk with you because you're the human factors guy. I mean, yeah. the automobile, I mean, people name their cars, Absolutely. you know, and uh, look, I'll use Lyft or Uber if I'm out traveling, sure. but I don't know if I'd use it for every day. I think I want my car in the garage, even if it's fully autonomous. And so my question is, I love what Jessica and Kevin are saying, are, are human beings going to adapt as quickly as the technology is changing? Well, you know, so again, I'll go, my, my colleagues in, at research right now are really looking at adoption and how, uh, be it driver simulators, we have uh, M-City as a, a large test track, to really understand how people interact with some of these advanced technologies, like advanced driver assisted systems, ADAS systems, and, and what, you know, how they would respond in autonomous vehicle situations, uh, particularly if there's a case where uh, a driver has to take back control uh, of the vehicle. <laughs> you know, w under what circumstances could they ever do that? Uh, so we have simulation studies, uh, focus groups, test track to try to uncover that. So um, I don't know if I have the answer to your question about the overall uh, adoption, but we're working towards that. Mm -hmm. Jessica, what's, what are your thoughts? How, how quickly will people adapt to this new means of getting mobility? So uh, again, it goes back to once or, whether it's a technology or something else, uh, people respond very quickly, right, when it's an improvement in their lives. So you think about sharing, uh, whether you're commuting to work on a chariot or using another shared service. Now you don't have to pay to, uh, you don't have to pay to park. You don't have to worry about finding parking, right? You didn't realize that finding parking was a pain point until you don't have to do it anymore and then you're kind of liberated from that piece of it. You didn't realize that a seamless payment or a seamless trip booking was actually painful until it was eliminated. But then you get into the more where technology overlaps. And so we announced at the auto show an Alexa integration through our sync product. And I have Alexa in my home and I didn't realize that I would um, think it come to have a conversation with my technology every day, but I do. Uh, and so that's someone who, you know, when I started my career, I had a Blackberry. Now we have, we have more smartphones and now we're talking to our devices. Five more years, who knows, right? And I think my parents would be comfortable talking to a device too. So I don't think it's generational either. Um, Interesting. I, I think you're, you've hit on the, what, what's problem does it solve and if there's an advantage we do it and I bring up the point of uh, plug-in hybrids and the fusion energy great vehicle and, and so many people were concerned when I brought it home in my house the three <laughs> women my <laughs> wife and two daughters about plugging it in charging how's this gonna work and uh, my daughters drove it primarily to start with and never had a problem plugging it in they figured out that they don't have to pay for gas if they plug it in they don't have to go get uh, they don't have to go to the gas station and I now drive it, and uh, it's fabulous. I'm getting over 800 miles to a tank, and really the, the joy of it is not going to the gas station. And so it's not that it charges you know, as quickly as, a, it, as it does at a gas pump. It's that I don't have to go to the gas pump. And it was interesting that my daughter, I, when she first started driving, the younger one, uh, she called me out and told me there's a light on in the dash. We've got to do something about this. And I go out and I'm looking for this check engine light that's on. Right. And uh, no, it's the one that looks like a little gas pump. And I had to bring her over there. That, doesn't that look like something? Well, she'd been driving for about six weeks and never been to a gas pump. And oh yeah, God. that's how you know when, when you need gasoline. Yeah, so that was a little, little, little learning moment. But boy, if it solves a problem, people are willing to do it. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I mean, the adoption of uh, ride sharing that we've seen, right, within the last five or so years with say Uber, Lyft, uh, classical car sharing, you know, the uptake rates, particularly for ride sharing, have been pretty incredible in cities. I mm -hmm. mean, it, across a wide range of demographics, right? It's not just millennials. You, you, You've see, seen you do it, it once? You do it once and say, oh, well, this is awesome, you know, or, you know, and then it can I, take I can, off from I there. I can see so. the car that's coming to get me. That's I mean, right. you just look at it, boy, that's just, uh, and the, the inhibitions people had of, of doing it, yeah. of trying to get my wife to do Uber was, a bit of a struggle, you know. Right. It's like, well, wait, hang on a second. Do we really want to do this? You know, and uh, but you do it once. Now she's an Uber fan and going fantastic. So where does this take us? Roll it out in a little bit. And the reason I ask, as you guys know, there's a big discussion, argument in the industry. 
oh, if we have all this mobility, all this sharing, we don't need as many cars. But, Kevin, you even raised the point, if now if you open up mobility to all segments of society, the very young, the very old, the disabled, people with DUI problems, and you drive down the cost, more people are going to use it. We'll have more cars on the road. Where is it going? Well, I think, I mean, there will always be a place for cars. And so we know that at Ford, right? And we remain committed to manufacturing vehicles probably for a long time to come. But I think what's interesting about that is exactly what you described. The reason we make cars in the first place is it was solving a mobility problem. It wasn't because we set out to be a vehicle company. Um, and so I think in the future, again, it goes back to where autonomy is the right place. It'll be more a question of where is a personally owned vehicle the right place? Where is a vehicle in a shared environment the right place? And where are those other things like high capacity transit a place? And that doesn't mean any one of those is the right solution for every trip. So you still may have a Mustang in your garage, but you might walk to the store or you might carpool with your wife to work. That's the future that is going to be in this next interim period for us, I think. I think, I think what we're really doing is uh, enhancing the toolbox or adding tools to the toolbox so that the, uh, the civil engineers, the civic planners can do new things to make sure that the cities run better. Uh, reduce congestion, reduce emissions, get you home from work so you're not stuck in traffic. You know, how do we do that? And you start thinking about how it makes life better. Um, I think that, right, we could get into this position where we just get more cars and we get right back to gridlock. But what we've got is a tool set now that was going to allow us to manage things. It's going to allow us to build the vehicles that uh, take advantage of the technology. It's going to allow us to put the technology in the cities that take advantage of uh, the, the brains and the smarts that the, the world's got. And we're going to be able to solve problems before they occur. Yeah. And, I was going to say, I mean, it, go back to research. I mean, there's lots of different scenarios that we're simulating, you know, and uptake and usage scenarios and what that means for the number of vehicles, uh, what that means for, you know, honestly, the, the technology and the, uh, how advanced these vehicles are. We, we know for sure that these vehicles are going to become much more advanced. You have concentration of usage, which then can drive features in these vehicles. So we can see that there's some acceleration of features that we can see in the vehicles. But we also think about it in terms of value creation. So in some way, this is, the industry is creating new sets of value for people to solve problems, to be it, be it accessibility, now they can get to locations they couldn't get to before, purchase new things they couldn't purchase before, get to jobs they couldn't do before, locations of employment can be quite different now than they are. So the, the dimensions of value are, are much greater now under this smart, connected, that's, shared That's a really world. good point. If you think so about it, if, if you're stuck in traffic less, how much more can you contribute to society? Well, in, some people say- job, recreation, some people say all the sharing and autonomy is, is going to boost the GDP because yeah. we're actually going to be more productive. We're not just going to be Absolutely. sitting in a car for, uh, most people sit in a car an hour a day, half hour to and from work. If you can put that to productive time or even your own personal time, there's a productivity bump that we ought to get out of it. And it's important, I think, to remember back to the value creation that there are people certainly in the U.S., but globally, who are unable to move um, either due to location or economic circumstance. They can't get to work. They can't get to school. And commute time is actually linked to your ability to advance your own kind of lot in life uh, economically. And so we know that the system today, whether it's gridlock or um, the way we've done public transit and bus routes in particular historically is you got a bus route going through your neighborhood and it comes every 10 minutes or half an hour or whatever it is. If you miss it, sorry, too bad. For a lot of people, that means sorry, too bad, and you just lost your job. Um, and so when you think about on-demand or other shared modes, that actually is creating value for people that um, again, historically been cut out of the system. And then even theoretically, these shared rides and on-demand rides should be cheaper than riding the bus. They could be because it's, again, better asset utilization and increasing throughput and all of those basic things that drive value. Yeah. Interesting. I, I've heard, uh, I read a story about a guy in San Francisco, in the city, but he had a garage, and he decided, yep, I don't need my car anymore. I'm going to lift or Uber it or I'm going to share whatever it is. And he converted his garage into an apartment. And he's renting uh, it out for $2,000 a month because you can do that in San Francisco. a lot of Uber rides. Do you see that kind of change coming? I mean, like I said at the very beginning of the show, the, the horseless carriage changed the landscape. Are we going to see an equal change? 
So it's funny, I lived in San Francisco for a while and uh, what's fascinating is a lot of people had actually done the opposite. They converted their backyard into their parking space and had made the choice that we didn't need the space in favor of being able to store a car off street. And so it's fascinating that potentially we're at a point where you can actually go back and reclaim public space or your yard. Um, but I do think so. I mean, we see this change in building code already in certain cities globally, where instead of mandating a certain number of parking spaces per um, unit, they're actually saying we're mandating the cap on how many. Or you know what, we're going to agree because of where you are, your proximity to transit or shared modes, you're not going to build parking at all. And then you think about if that's close to work, now your quality of life is improved because your commute time is shorter and you're living in a community where you see your neighbors every day. When those things start to all come together, that's when it gets really interesting. I gotta tell you, unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap this conversation up now. I can't wait for the future that you guys are talking about. This sounds pretty good to me. And I wanna thank all three of you for having come in today. Robert Hampshire, Jessica Robinson, Kevin Layden, fascinating discussion, I really liked it. And I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. Underwriting for Autoline this week has been provided by Borg Warner.